Um, so just uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the webinar series right now, um, just so that uh, everybody's aware of um, what's going on here. So uh, Healthy Waters Lac La Biche, which is a uh, we're a nonprofit group out of um, out of Lac La Biche, Alberta, and um, we are also known as the Lac La Biche Region Watershed Stewardship Society. Just recently changed our name to Healthy Waters. Um, so uh, we were planning on doing a series of, um, of open houses in Lac La Biche over this past year um, through a grant from uh, the Nature Conservancy. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we've had to change those plans. Um, so this webinar series is a um, sort of a substitution for this year, but we're hope still hoping to, to offer the, um, the open houses next year. Um, so I'm Mike Schultz and I am the president of Healthy Waters Lac La Biche. And um, yeah, we will probably see some members from Healthy Waters join us uh, throughout, uh, or we, we do have some members here and probably see some more. Um, and actually I'm just having two more people join us right here. Um, so yeah, we've been having this webinar series. We've, we're having them on the second, I mean the first and uh, third Thursdays of every month. And so uh, you have caught us uh, two away from our last webinar. So there's going to be two more webinars yet. One on August 20th um, by, um, pardon me, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong ones here. One on September 17th, pardon me, um, uh, planning for healthy lakes. Um, uh, from, and that's going to be with uh, Jane Oh, I'm going to get her last name pronounced wrong. Sorry, Jane. Jane Delfini, um, who is with uh, Municipal Planning Services in Alberta, and she's going to be presenting together with Erin McFarlane Dyer. Um, and then on October 1st, we're going to have one that's going to be presented by myself on what is a wetland um, and, and getting us to be able to recognize wetlands when we see them because a lot of people really don't understand what a wetland is and they don't recognize there's the diversity of wetlands that are out there. So those are their, the upcoming webinars. So welcome to today's webinar everybody um, and we are going to be discussing today the scientific studies uh, around Lac La Biche with Nathan Ballard from Alberta Environment Parks, who is a limnologist and a water quality specialist with uh, the government of Alberta. So uh, before we get too far into it, I just wanna make sure everybody knows what they're doing with Zoom. So if you look down at the very bottom of your screen with Zoom, I would encourage you guys to um, use the reactions down there on the bottom if you want to, to give a thumbs up or a clap for a particular poignant point that uh, Nathan's made for us today. Um, I, um, uh, Nathan, are you gonna be using any polls or anything with our presentation today? No, like I said, um, I, I, with the group this size, I, I'm happy to just discuss them out in the open and okay. um, like, uh, I try to keep it conversational so we can uh, we can converse back. Okay, good, good. Yeah, and so um, there is going to be a chat there as well. Um, so the chat is um, a great way for you to ask questions as well. Um, if you don't want to use your um, don't want to use your mic to ask a question, feel free to use that chat and I'll keep my eye on it and try and make sure I um, ask your question of Nathan if he misses it. Um, so that's that, I would encourage everybody to keep your mics muted in, unless you are asking a question. I, I would though, however, encourage you guys to keep your cameras on if you can, you've got decent bandwidth because I know as a presenter, it's always nice to be able to see the people that I'm presenting to and see the happy faces and the oohs and the ahs that are coming from our audience, not just trying to give a talk to a, uh, a, uh, a bare screen. So I um, would encourage you guys to, ha to have those cameras on. If I do happen to notice that uh, you're giving us a little bit of feedback, I will mute you. Um, but if you, you will be able to unmute yourself if you choose. All right, so that's, I hope, hopefully have covered all of the, um, 
backgroundy kind of things that we we need to discuss here and while I've done that I've noticed that we have had a few more people join us so that's great um, we have a Jordan who's saying he's not getting audio I think everyone else everyone else is good for audio um, so I think something Jordan is that's wrong with your audio that's something going on with your computer or your speakers or something like that so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to help you too much with that um, this video will be uploaded to YouTube when um, when we are able to uh, so uh, you can always go back and and listen to it there if you're unable to um, get it working there Jordan so Nathan could you introduce us for yourself tell us a little bit about what you do and kind of what a, a limnologist does at AEP on a general day Gladly. Gladly. Okay, so uh, my name is Nathan Ballard. Um, I got my master's of science uh, in earth and atmospheric science at the University of Alberta uh, long enough ago where I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't want to date myself too much. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, uh, I ended up doing exactly what I went to school to do or, or a postgraduate to do is, is I, um, I went there to study lakes, uh, specifically looking at uh, geochemistry uh, and biogeochemical cycling within lake sediments or so interaction between sediment and water. Um, and so that led me to a, uh, you know, in a roundabout way, kind of got me, um, uh, eventually landed me the job as the limnologist. Now, that does, it did kind of take a little bit of a, a, a left turn because limnologists in, for the province tend to focus on flowing waters, so rivers and streams. So this is a nice kind of way back for me to, um, you know, come back and think about lakes again, because it has been a little bit, uh, my focus has been elsewhere. So it's been nice to revisit some of this stuff. Um, on a day to day, um, it's hard to say that a limnologist working for the province only does one thing. I'm in a very specific, um, I, would, I would factor them into three general areas, okay? So there's limnologists who uh, perform sort of scientific studies uh, for our science and monitoring division, watershed sciences, I think they're called now. Um, and so they're, they're the ones that uh, do kind of foundational research. Um, you know, published papers, that sort of thing, in, in academic journals. Um, there's another branch where, that focuses on policy, specifically, sort of setting provincial policy and, and, and making sure um, uh, that you know the, uh, the decision makers are, are are well informed on that angle. Um, and where I come into the picture is I'm in, in something called resource management. And so I'm, I'm the, I provide expertise to our uh, approvals engineers, our compliance staff, um, and that sort of thing. And um, essentially it's an operational role um, where um, uh, I, I imp I'm in charge, well, I'm not in charge of drafting the policy, I'm more in charge of implementing it. And that's gonna be well reflected in, in the talk I've chosen to give today. Um, because um, essentially what I've, uh, what I've done is I've, I've rather, I've, in the original title that I'd sent, I'd, I'd intended to go through sort of an itemize of a, a list of scientific studies and kind of go through and, and, and pull out the implications of each. Then I thought, um, why not let's back up a little bit, let's do narrow the focus of, of the breadth of scientific studies and, and just focus a little bit more on um, how can I translate these into more practical and um, uh, some things that people can apply within their own spheres of influence? So, so that's me, um, and uh, well, at least what I do for work, anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Nathan. We're really looking forward to the presentation. We've had a, a number of people join us, including um, including our mayor, Omar McGrabby. So thank you. Er, great to see you, um, Mayor, and also uh, Brian Deheer, our VP. So um, yeah, I'm going to 
give it to you, give the table over to you. Sure, Mike. Thank you very much. And am I showing the right screen? Okay, so, yeah, so, um, like I said, my name is Nathan Ballard. Uh, I'm, I work for the Research Stewardship Division within Alberta Environment Parks. And so, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do, as I just explained, is take a couple of studies. Um, one uh, that's pretty well known um, from, from David Schindler's group, but just looking at sort of to kind of get an idea of, of what's going on with the, uh, the lake history, and then uh, a little bit of my own uh, uh, work that I did in my master's degree and how that will inform this conversation. Um, so an overview of what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, just basically set up the very basic scientific foundations of, of, of the eutrophication of lakes, uh, and, and specifically why we tend to focus in on phosphorus. Um, we'll go through the, a little bit of the paleo on, on lack of fish. Um, and then we'll just kind of look at, uh, establish some of the important processes on um, why I'm focusing on the uh, particular aspects of, of what I'm focusing on. Uh, and I'm not I'm choosing not to go down specific rabbit holes of, uh, of, of you know, and uh, going into needless complexity um, and uh, how that sort of allows us to take away some general principles uh, that we can hopefully apply. And so we'll do that. We'll take a quick look at, uh, uh, at some of the um, watershed environments that we are important uh, for managing the nutrients, some of the nutrient sinks. Um, and then we'll go into uh, a little bit of, uh, as far as the management, um, what kind of things that we're just try to pick out some very, very basic things that we can all uh, apply and, and, and take home with us, uh, provide a few examples of, of, of some of the human uses and how those might apply to them. Um, and we'll try to wrap it up with some, some common threads about what to think about when we're uh, uh, thinking about some of these management tactics. And then um, I'll, we'll discuss briefly a little bit of the implementation and, and approach. So uh, starting off, why do we focus on phosphorus? Uh, well, in the late 60s, um, the government of Canada established something called the environmental uh, or experimental lakes area. And uh, the program was led by David Schindler, who published some very, very uh, important studies. And that was also, they, there's a number of famous individuals or famous scientists, world-class guys who are all, pardon my, <laughs> pardon my dogs. <laughs> I hope that's not too, uh, so anyway, um, the, the one that uh, I, I find really kind of grabs my attention and it is, is the Lake 226 study that David Schindler published on in 1974. So what they did is they took a, a curtain, uh, the same type of material they used for mesocosms to do um, targeted, uh, uh, to do kind of like in-lake studies. Um, I'm terribly sorry about the uh, background noise. Um, Can you excuse me for just one second? I'm going. I, I'm. I'm terribly sorry about this. Perfectly all right. We all know what it's like to have dogs and kids and whatnot interrupt us. So I guess I'm going to be entertaining you now. So I've actually prepared a little song. Um, so no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm just, I could do a song with, oh, Nathan's back. Uh, that's too bad, because the mayor was going to practice a speech. Okay. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry about that. I, we, we just got a new puppy, and he gets excited about pretty much everything that, uh, <laughs> that happens. Um, so where was, okay, so Experimental Lakes area. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did, the government of Canada set aside some 
uh, a series of lakes in, in eastern Ontario, or western Ontario, my fault, um, where we could perform some uh, experiments. And, and so what David Schindler tended to focus on nutrient addition experiments, among other things. And we could, um, the advantage to doing this is that they can focus, uh, understand what's going on in the entire ecosystem. Um, but the key point for this is that at the time, there's a lot of debate about whether what was driving eutrophication, whether or not it was carbon or nitrogen or a number of the things, but uh, the evidence was starting to emerge that um, phosphorus was essentially a culprit. And so this series of studies is essentially why we have phosphate-free soaps today. Um, and so the Lake 226 experiment, um, they set the current side, they added carbon and nitrogen to one side, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, to the other, and essentially uh, this picture speaks for itself as to what happened. We had one side of the lake eutrophy very, he uh, very heavily, and then on the other side didn't really eutrophy that much. Uh, Dylan and Rigler had also published some correlations looking at from several different lakes, uh, looking at chlorophyll um, concentrations as well, comparing that to total phosphorus concentrations. Uh, Schindler again in 1979 published a study in uh, from the neighboring lake, Lake 227, um, where they performed uh, phosphorus only additions uh, to that lake and manipulated it and got uh, this correlation curve. And then so things kind of settled down. Everybody thought, okay, we, we've solved this one, we're good to go, right? And then so um, uh, the, a lot of the research into phosphorus kind of died down for a little while. And then uh, it started to come up a little bit again. A, a, a lot of uh, people started advocating for, you know, other nitrogen control, that sort of thing. That prompted David Schindler and his group again to publish a um, 37 year continuous record of their experimentation on, on Lake 227 that basically showed that they were not able to uh, control the eutrophication of that lake uh, by manipulating nitrogen. They were only able to control that eutrophication by manipulating the phosphorus additions. So I'm of that school of thought as well. And so I'm, I'm going to focus on phosphorus for uh, a lot of this presentation. And so what that means sort of locally is again, uh, David Lindler and his group from the University of Alberta, they went and they cored uh, in the years leading up to 2008, uh, Black Labish. And they put together a multi-proxy um, paleo record of these two cores within that lake. Uh, and they, this was published in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences in 2008. Um, and I pulled out excerpts of it, uh, of, of things that kind of speak to me as, as, as sort of summarizing the gist of it. There's, there's uh, biological evidence, uh, fossil evidence that they provide, uh, a number of it, which I won't necessarily go into today. Um, I'm just kind of, as a summary, this, is, uh, th this kind of speaks to some of the story that I like to tell today. And so, uh, I'm going to focus on the stoichiometric ratios that they published uh, and some of the stable isotope work that they've done. So they grabbed two cores, one in the area. Of, sorry, are you able to see my cursor when I'm? Yes? Okay, perfect. So uh, their site D1 um, on, uh, was grabbed near the community uh, of Lac Labiche. These, uh, these are essentially. Uh, represent, the colors here are representative of the depth uh, in the lake at the time of coring. And so they grab one core at the deepest point um, near the community, and then they went uh, to the other basin and grabbed another core there. Uh, the results on the left correspond to uh, this core here, and the results on the right correspond to that core. Um, and so we'll start. Um, <clears throat> 
essentially how, what do these mean, right? So this, uh, the C here means carbon, the N here means nitrogen, the P here means phosphorus, okay? And why this is important is uh, essentially, um, all things considered, uh, stoichiometric ratios of organic matter tend to be uh, fairly constant, or but also representative of, of what's going on in the environment, especially um, when uh, with with algae, and that is accumulated an organic matter that accumulates on the uh, bottom of lakes. So what happens here is that um, as the carbon to nitrogen ratio decreases, that means that nitrogen is accumulating proportionally faster than uh, the carbon was, at least proportionally to what it was before. And so with these cores, uh, what, what they've done is they've essentially gone to these lakes, they drop down a tube and they drop plunger on top of that creates a section, uh, suction and they're able to pull cores out intact. Um, and so the sediments appear in order in which they were deposited, right? So older sediments lay on top of younger sediments. And they just pile up over time. And they're able to ascribe dates to these by using radioactive isotopes that are naturally occurring within those sediments. They're not abundant, but they are occurring. And so based on the decay rate of those- Nathan, I think- Nathan? I think yes. it's younger ones over top of older ones, right? Older ones at yes. the bottom. Yes, exactly. Younger sediments on top of older sediments. And so that is the way that these are, are displayed, right? So long story short, they're able to calculate based on what they find in the sediments, uh, rough ages of where each of these go. So the youngest sediments would have been happening at the top, the oldest sediments at the bottom. Right? So over time, What's happened is that around beginning to mid last century is that we started to see some excursions in, in what's going on. And, and so we started to see more nitrogen being deposited relative to carbon and more, more, more phosphorus being deposited relative to carbon and more phosphorus uh, being deposited relative to nitrogen, okay? And so what this is telling us is that the ratios of the nutrients in the lake have begun to change, okay? And so when we talk about, we talked about in our last slide about how phosphorus is limiting the growth of, um, uh, of algae, right? And so what that, what that does, if we're adding phosphorus relative or at a faster rate than we're adding the other nutrients, sometimes it creates an, a demand. And so organisms, once they consume, consume the easy source of some of those other nutrients, they start to turn to other sinks, right? So um, the source, of nitrogen in this case is what I'll focus on here has begun to change. All right, so we're starting to see nitrogen, different nice uh, isotopes of nitrogen also showing up. And, and this is important to this particular study, and it shows the contrast between the east and west basins really, um, and, and I'll get to why that's important here. It is, uh, essentially in the East Basin, away from the communities, we just saw this, uh, our nitrogen isotopes just kind of start to get lighter and lighter and lighter, right? And this is compared to the average nitrogen in the air. So that, uh, based on what they've, uh, all of the evidence they've collectively shown in this uh, study, Essentially, what they've uh, hypothesized here, um, and uh, it's hard to be absolutely definitive, 100% certainty, but it, it makes a lot of sense, 
is that on the east basin is that the algae in the lake started to more and more get their nitrogen from the air and fix it from the atmosphere. Okay? So these are things like our blue-green algae, uh, cyanobacteria, things that they have that capability where other types of algae don't necessarily have that. Okay? So that's an important finding. Okay? So that it suggests that we're getting more nitrogen fixing and some of the other evidence that they showed in here backs that up. In this particular study, you actually back that up. So what's interesting is that we're also seeing a different process here in the West Basin. Okay, the nitrogen isotopes are doing something completely different. Right, and there's a good explanation for that. We're seeing uh, this record is a little bit shorter. Note the dates here, don't go back quite as far as this one. Um, but the same sort of trends apply in, in all these uh, ecological ratios. Right? We're still seeing the same things kind of happen. But our nitrogen isotopes are going in the other direction. Okay. And so what that came, comes from is that uh, organisms are inherently, I don't want to say lazy, but they're, they're very good at conserving energy, right? And so when um, we consume something, right, there's a tendency for us to assimilate the, the lightest isotopes of that first before we assimilate the heavier isotopes. It's a very, very, very small, minute, very tiny amounts of energy that are conserved in doing that, but you do that billions and trillions of times, extrapolate that over an entire population, and that starts to make a difference. But, and then additionally, when you take that waste and put it into a wastewater treatment plant and let the bacteria do the same thing, right? What end up left over tends to be heavier isotopes because the lighter isotopes are, are degassed to the atmosphere, denitrifiers use them, and so that, that tends to happen. So what we're see, seeing in this signal is actually um, the discharge of effluent into the lake, right? And so right around this time, people were also noticing that, that the lake was getting you know, more, more eutrophic, right? The, the, the pea soup cream became, which seemed to be getting more and more common. People were uh, fewer and more complaints about the water quality uh, deterioration and, and that type of thing. So I believe it was back in, in the 1980s or, or thereabouts. Um, they start, they stopped um, discharging the, the effluent from the wastewater treatment plant into the lake and they moved it out to field lake. Right? So they started discharging out here, which um, was, was a good plan. I think at the time there's a belief that that would run off to a different system. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it connects through Red Deer Brook, <laughs> Brook and, and, and um, flows back into the lake. Right? So, and I'm happy to announce though, I mean, within the last decade, that Lacrobish has again upgraded their uh, wastewater treatment um, so that the effluent that is going into Field Lake is actually far greater quality because for a while there, uh, water quality within Field Lake was beginning to deteriorate as well. And that, of course, flows back into the uh, Lacrobish. And so that was uh, becoming an issue. But, Lacklebish has been pretty proactive, um, in my view, uh, for dealing with their wastewater treatment plant effluent. So kudos. Um, so essentially, um, that is what we get uh, from, uh, as far as a lake history, from looking at the sediments within Lacklebish. That that's th that's the Coles notes. Is is that we we see very um, uh, we see that effluent input and it's having 
uh, impact um, and affecting the water quality within the lake. But that's not the whole story, right? Because let's not forget about what was going on over here. You aren't necessarily seeing that bump, right? We're still seeing the eutrophication. We're not seeing uh, that same bump uh, in the nitrogen. So there, are, well, that was one kind of issue that was affecting the water quality in the lake. It's not the whole story, right? So there's a number, there, there are other sources of nutrient that, nutrients to the lake that aren't uh, just um, the effluent that we discharge. And so that's, that's kind of going to be the focus of my, 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 uh, the rest of my talk today. And so some of these um, loads, they come in really, this is a bit of a, a simplification, but we talked about the discharge, right? Um, but there's also, we get it through runoff, lakes or, or rivers, streams, overland flow. Um, those nutrients can be picked up and deposited in the lake through those processes. Uh, also dust and aerosols that are in the air when it rains, those can be deposited back into the lake. And once they're in the lake, they can also be um, recycled uh, back from the sediments back into the water column. So those are some of the major sources of, uh, of loading to the lake. And to give you an example of some of the, uh, the scale uh, of, of, of how those might appear, let's move to Pigeon Lake for a little bit and say um, this is a Pigeon Lake is, is another Alberta lake. It's uh, agricultural community, um, in agriculture in the, in, in the watershed. Um, so in the, the dust fall and precipitation, it's not always this hot but it can comprise a, a significant uh, portion of the phosphorus budget of the lake. Also runoff is, was uh, early on, probably about the same time that we were thinking about uh, that Lacrobish was, was a chain of moving its effluents to Field Lake. About this time, nobody thought that internal loads of phosphorus were even significant, right? But uh, within uh, Alberta lakes, they tend to be fairly significant. Not always this high, but uh, they, they can be. So we have uh, an internal component um, that can feed the algae uh, uh, quite, uh, quite handily. Right? So um, runoff isn't the only consideration, but if the phosphorus isn't in the lake to begin with, it can't recycle back into the water column, which is why we tend to focus on external loads. And so I'm not going, don't, don't get too, <laughs> I'm not going to go into all of this. Uh, I, I put this up here. Um, this is data from my master's thesis uh, that basically shows I did core a series of lakes we're looking at chemical to establish chemical gradients across uh, something representative um, across a chemical gradient, not each and every lake, right? So we went to all these different lakes, we cored, we separated this, the sediments you know, from those cores, we separated the pore water that was in those cores from the sediment, and we analyzed what was in the pore water, right? And so we got these chemical gradients, and I'm not gonna try to, uh, I'm not gonna explain what all of this means, uh, but the takeaway is that I found like within the set of where I cored in lack of fish, we found we were kind of in that Goldilocks zone, right? Uh, it uh, wasn't uh, excessive amounts of internal loading, um, but there wasn't uh, the absence of it either. The takeaway message is that uh, internal loads are probably a thing and something worth considering. Um, a basically takeaway message from this slide is it's happening there, right? Um, so it's not something that we can ignore. And why that is important is because um, we're seeing a lot of the, um, a lot of deep dives into complexity now about what forms of phosphorus are important to control, right? 
is that uh, is we only mitigate for dissolved phosphorus and because uh, total phosphorus isn't bioavailable it's not ready for plants to uptake yet until um, you know so should we only be uh, mitigating for the dissolved phases and, and you hear a little bit of that so this is just my way of saying um, just because it's not bioavailable when it goes into the lake doesn't mean it's never going to become bioavailable. So all of this to tell you, make that simple point and how that works is essentially total phosphorus include particulate phosphorus, organic matter goes into the lake, it decomposes, the nutrients get released back into the water column. So long story short is that we need to consider all forms of phosphorus that are going to the lake. And the easiest way to manage it is just to keep it out of the lake, <laughs> right? In the first place. Don't let it get there in the first place. <laughs> um, so, um, but again, we're not all swimming around at the bottom of the lake. We're not managing sediments at the bottom of the lake. We are trying, we, are, we live on, in the watershed. That's where we are at. But a lot of those same principles kind of apply. I'm not going to go through uh, each one of these processes and say, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, are we talking like there's chemistry, there's thermodynamics, all of this, you know. But I'm trying to try to simplify this whole mess for you and just focus on the things that we can manage, right? Because it can get pretty complex, but there's no need to go there for for right now. Um, things that we can control fairly easy is what we put on the landscape, what we add, and what runs off. Okay, so essentially um, we can see conversation. Uh, there's a lot of conversation around what's the devolved phase and the particulate phase. This is kind of why, uh, I, I, and, and people tend to get, go down those bunny trails and uh, and focus on that. That's kind of why I wanted to prepare you for that uh, conversation a little bit. But we're going to focus on, try to boil this all down and, and make it easy. Okay. So for, I'd like to focus for practically on just sort of four key sort of management strategies, right? This is kind of the through lines that I see. Um, is A, we want to manage erosion, right? B, we want to manage our runoff and groundwater. And I put those together for this reason, is if we can get water on the landscape to infiltrate and go into the groundwater, it's not running off, right? So we, if we can keep our surfaces porous and encourage infiltration, that, that's, that's good, right? Um, third, we'll manage our effluents, much as Black Bush has been doing. Uh, repeatedly for the last uh, um, you know, 40 years now, okay, <laughs> or longer. <laughs> um, and then we, once you've kind of got those bases covered, if you want to take it further, then yeah, go, go start looking into uh, more site-specific factors. But just for the absolute basics, um, just manage erosion, manage runoff, manage groundwater, uh, and, and manage your effluents. And so where do I get these? Uh, um, these these key points is they essentially come from a water budget of lake, right? Things are going into the lake; they're most likely being carried there by water, right? So uh, when we're, we simple math, these are the um, uh, these are the factors we consider: uh, runoff, groundwater, precipitation, and and effluent, right? Now we can't manage precipitation; we know that. Um, we can't control the weather, so we're going to focus on the other ones that we can't control. And we have some landscape features that offer those services to us. Uh, so we can take advantage of them. Uh, and this is part of the reason why we want to, um, uh, we want to uh, preserve these areas and, uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, this is, this is why, these are the tools we're gonna use to, to manage those, uh, those 
those factors were considered. So wetlands, okay. I mean, they, um, Michael, I'm not going <laughs> to lecture you too much on this because I, uh, I, I, I'll wait. We'll wait for your presentation. I'm sure you go into far more depth than this. Um, but yeah, they be, they provide water storage. So they stop water on the landscape. They, they give it uh, a chance to infiltrate into the ground. Right. They do provide some some water purification. They retain sediments, um, and they give the vegetation opportunity to take it up. Um, but key sinks in this in these environments are the sediments and the vegetation. Forested land, again, nutrients tend to accumulate. Forested systems, they're uptaken by sediments and vegetation. Okay, so there's a lot of complexity we can go in there, um, and um, you know there, there's there's some other events such as fire and that can, can change the dynamics, but at the end of the day, take home message is, again, sediments and vegetation. Those are our sinks. And vegetation on the landscape actually helps to keep these sediments in place. Riparian areas, again, they provide those very same, um, well, not exactly the same benefits, but uh, also very much similar concepts, again. Uh, they, they uh, retain sediment on the landscape, they stabilize banks, and uh, um, I mean they provide other benefits like wildlife habitat and biodiversity. Um, the plants take up the nutrients uh, to remove it. Um, and uh, again, those, are the, those pay attention to those two key sinks, sediments and vegetation. And I wanted to focus on the riparian areas a little bit more. Um, just we'll, we'll touch a little bit uh, I, I did add a point here that says, in general, that increasing the buffer width of a riparian area will resort in more nutrient uh, removal opportunities, okay? And so I wanted to uh, just point on this a, a little bit more because a little bit goes a long way with riparian areas. And there's a USGS, um, did a, a meta-analysis that kind of looked at the extent of it, um, how much this kind of helps. And I'm, I'll show the graph here in a second. Uh, but before we do that, um, there's other, there's plenty of studies. I think there's a, a study of the University of Georgia that also did kind of a meta, uh, looked at an overview of, or a review of scientific papers. And they came up with, um, they came up with uh, how trying to set a buffer zone of somewhere around 100 meters or something like that. That that was that was you know, and I'm not uh, I'm not um, uh, questioning that their science on that. I think it's they they did some very good work, but the point I'm trying to make here is that if 100 meters isn't feasible for you, you know, start small because the the benefits of just even a small area uh, are significantly better than having no, no benefits. You can spare a meter, that's better, that's way, way, way better than having nothing, right? And it's kind of like Pareto's principle, where you do put in 20% of the effort, you get 80% of the, uh, the, uh, the, the payoff. Um, so this is what the USGS had came up with. They, they modeled that um, starting, you know, Around 100 meters, you, you get about 90% of the nutrient removal. This is around nitrogen figures, but um, so if you can't do that, uh, you can only do 25, great, you're still getting 75% of the nutrient removal capabilities. Um, if you can only show up bare five meters, you're still getting half of that nutrient uh, removal capability. But I'm not saying like, uh, you know, what we can kind of get away with, what I'm saying is that um, one meter is exponentially better than no meters <laughs> of buffer zone. Uh, and uh, the, the starting that um, will provides exponential nutrient removal capabilities um, at, at the 
Um, okay, so start basically, uh, if you have none, uh, adding just a little bit will make a huge difference as far as the nutrient removal capabilities. If you have lots and can spare more, even better, right? Um, and and uh, natural landscapes will um, will perform better, but um, the idea is just um, if if you can't do the hundred meters, there's no no sense in just throwing up your hands and and saying uh, that it's not worth it to do because it absolutely is. And so um, that's just kind of like a, a brief uh, look at some of the important natural features on the landscape that I want to look at. Uh, I'm just going to look at uh, do quick examples of the uh, some human land uses um, and just sort of try to pull out some key themes from those. Okay, so cultivated land, right? Um, right? So we have sediment accounts for a very large proportion of the phosphorus that's exported from that, right? And the runoff volume is directly related to the sediment transport from cultivated land. Um, so what are our strategies to deal with it? We manage erosion, right? Slow the velocity of water and, um, and wind, minimize the disturbance if, if possible, um, and we manage the runoff and infiltration, right? And then you start to look at other site-specific factors, right? You can look at slopes and soil types and crops and tillage practices, fertilizer applications, all of those things, right? But it really starts with um, manage erosion and manage runoff. Livestock, also very much the same, right? Um, we, um, right? So exports of, of phosphorus tend to be um, in, in soil, vegetation, and animal waste, and, and fertilizer, right? Um, but the drivers are, again, runoff, erosion, and other soil factors. You know, you start to get into those, the um, you know, site-specific factors of, of what kind of wildlife and so on and so forth. Uh, not overcrowding your livestock. Um, but also, livestock are sentient beings and they tend to like the water in riparian areas very much. And I'm sure that, uh, um, I'm not sure if you've see, seen Carrie O'Shaughnessy speak from cows and fish, but she'll, she'll drive this point home is that, uh, you know, keep the, <laughs> keep the cows out of the water. And she's, uh, she's been, um, uh, you know, pushing that message since I was in grad school and she's very good at it and far more convinced, <laughs> convincing uh, a speaker than I. And uh, so, yeah, but again, coming back to those sort of key concepts are manage erosion, right? Uh, manage your runoff. Part of, in this case, uh, managing a runoff is, is managing soil compaction and allowing water to make sure that soils don't get too compacted and that, you know, water can actually infiltrate those types of things. There are some other considered, but core theme, manage runoff, manage erosion and then worry about site-specific factors. If you've got a, a, an intensive livestock operation and you're managing animal waste, I consider that sort of managing an effluent as well, um, but you know, keep your manure is away from the water as well, um, would, would also be a factor. So, uh, and again, sort of urban and industrial uses, right? Again, uh, we talked about uh, the effluent from wastewater treatment plant, uh, we're, we're getting really actually quite good at uh, capturing and treating wastewater. Uh, we're not as good at, uh, at man yet at managing uh, all of the runoff. We do have stormwater retention ponds. We do um, uh, have systems in place for municipalities and stuff that we, we do tend to manage those. Um, so we tend to do a fairly good idea, a good job uh, in this uh, in this area. Um, but again, there are some uh, same principles can apply. Manage our erosion. I think we're doing fairly good at that. Um, managing our runoff and groundwater. Uh, two are points of improvement for a lot of municipalities are, um, you know, a lot of concrete, right? Not really allowing infiltration uh, opportunities for for water data become groundwater and infiltrate 
um, and wetland preservation uh, in a lot of these areas, and in some cases, some soil compaction, those types of things. Um, but otherwise, I think as far as the managing effluent, um, we've, we've put in that uh, 20 to 50 percent of the effort, and we are reaping a, a fairly significant benefit from, the, from that. So, common threads between all of these, I'm becoming a broken record. Sorry to repeat myself again. Manage your erosion, manage your uh, runoff, and manage your effluents. Uh, and then start to look at uh, uh, site specific factors. And if uh, uh, common threads between what gets managed in all of these are essentially preserving or like making sure sediments don't run off and, and, and keeping native vegetation on the landscape. So, those are our through lines. How do we implement it, right? Um, well, a lot of lakes, uh, Black Ambition included, um, municipalities have a lot of uh, discretion um, and uh, over land use decisions within, um, within their, their jurisdictions. Um, so the, that's one option um, that uh, local communities can take some, uh, some initiatives and, 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 and decide on some of their priorities. Um, again, um, watershed and uh, lake management plans, those are again community-led initiatives. Um, those are enabled under the Water for Life. Uh, watershed planning and advisory councils uh, take, tend to operate on a little bit larger scale but uh, than, than individual watersheds, but uh, uh, they are another example of sort of community-led uh, initiatives that um, can uh, produce these plans which are, are very much considered in de decision making. Um, and stewardship groups, much like uh, Healthy Waters, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, they do good work and they, uh, they can perform a lot of the on the ground initiatives and public education, uh, much like this forum. Uh, so that is our uh, uh, tends to be our, our, our provincial focus and, and approach uh, to really sort of work with these groups and try to support them. Um, but as far as the empowerment, it really comes from the local communities and, 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 and uh, people in those communities uh, tends to be the approach. Uh, it's not to say that we haven't tried the, uh, the opposite approach. I mean, there are water management plans that exist in the province. Uh, that are administered under the uh, Water Act. That tends to be a little bit more top-down control, but they tend to focus more on things like water allocations and not necessarily uh, water quality uh, type initiatives. Um, so essentially, the, I'm going to uh, kind of wrap it up there um, and, and try to take some questions. Um, if there's, uh, uh, yeah, and, and thank uh, you folks for showing up and listening to me blather <laughs> and uh, repeat myself probably one too many times at least. Um, but uh, thank you for your time and attention and uh, I'm happy to uh, uh, discuss any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, I have, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I think um, wouldn't be a bad idea to, uh, to uh, discuss. So I'll just uh, throw them. So when you were talking about internal loads, uh, maybe explain for those that aren't as familiar what exactly you mean by internal loads and um, and how they are important. Okay, so internal loads are basically once we have the phosphorus come into the lake, right? It gets uh, it gets taken up by our algae or whatever, or it comes in and uh, a form that's not bioavailable um, and uh, it flows to the bottom of the lake and it gets incorporated into the sediments. Okay, and so once it's in the sediments, it doesn't stay inert, it doesn't always stay there. There is going to be some of the fraction that is going to, um, you know, with micros, you know, breaking down organic matter, whatever it happens to be, changes in pH, whatever the conditions have to be that cause. Um, uh, some of that, uh, those nutrients to be released by the sediments into the pore waters and then diffuse back up into the lakes. And so 
collectively we call that an internal phosphorus load because it creates a, a, um, it's a significant portion of, of uh, phosphorus budgets in, in Alberta lakes or tends to. Okay, great. So, so how, um, you, I think one thing that someone um, might get out of this is, well, then why don't we just dig all the sediment out of there and then we got get rid of all this phosphorus load. <laughs> okay, I can well, I can hear that question already in the back of some people's heads. Well, That's I mean, rich lake. a you you'll be digging deep <laughs> for for quite a while. Um, and so I mean, there's there's a couple things. Is a that's expensive. Like <laughs> Black Labiche is a huge lake. Um, so I mean, the costs alone on that. Uh, second is, is you're probably not going to get approval from the province to <laughs> to alter. Uh, uh, well, I don't. I don't want. I don't want to prejudge anything, but um, it, it's it's likely not feasible. It's probably very very expensive and definitely far more expensive than just uh, managing phosphorus on the landscape and again, keeping phosphorus out of the lake to begin with. That is by far the cheapest option. Let's just stick with that <laughs> and, and leave the logistics uh, discussion to uh, uh, another day. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so when you were talking about the landscape features like wetlands and forests and riparian areas, um, I had a question that then that means that the more of those kinds of features that we have on the landscape, um, the better then? As a general rule of thumb, I'd say sure. Um, where they occur is also important, right? As we discussed um, with the, the riparian areas and stuff, is, is that you know, um, you know, if if you're making, you know, uh, placement is also important. So there, there's a, there's an aspect of planning here. Um, and there are going to be other site specific factors around soil characteristics, like you've got hot spots where there's lots of tons and tons of phosphorus somewhere. Uh, so you've got a fertilizer pile, uh, put a riparian area in front of that, <laughs> you know, and like, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and uh, uh, slopes are also very important to keep the sort of natural um, features on. Uh, if you've got really steep floats, slopes, those tend to be, um, uh, you know, you're going to get more erosion uh, from those types of places. Um, so there are definitely site specific factors. Um, and uh, it's not, I can't just generalize and say that every wetland is going to be created equal. Every wetland type is going to be provide exactly the same benefits. There, there's definitely some more complexible complexities there. Mm. Um, but again, those are sort of getting into the site specific factors. Um, but general rule of thumb, I would say yes, the, if we preserve our natural landscape features, you're probably going to see some uh, ecological benefits from that. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, there's some also some comments here. Um, we had Jay White come and, and speak at an earlier talk and uh, he kind of summarized it as sediments and nutrients are some of the key things there. If we manage and reduce those, it will help us uh, improve lake water quality, which very much reflecting what you were talking about. Um, also, um, Colin Code here has mentioned uh, that wetlands are like the kidneys of the earth body. So important in our overall health. Every little bit we can do can help to maintain, or that we can do to maintain and develop them will help. Um, and Brian has commented that the SHIM study looked at the riparian uh, health of the perimeter of the whole lake shore, identified the good and the bad and the in-between of, um, of the, the health of those areas. Mm -hmm. Any comments on those comments? Um, well, certainly. I mean, the, the, I, I, a lot of these same uh, features uh, are, aren't necessarily just going to apply to the lake shore, right? And so um, looking at, well, these are also going to apply on tributaries, those types of things. 
Um, so yes, um, prioritize efforts where, where you've had the most impact and seen the degradation. Um, I, I think that, those, that that information is also very um, important. Um, and I certainly uh, am not going to uh, try to step in and, and usurp any of those other studies or, or say that studies that provide more specific information aren't important. They absolutely are. My goal here today was just to kind of give you those basic rules of thumb. If that you're getting lost in the complexity, just kind of step back. These are basic rules of thumb that will get you most of the way there. Great. Well, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, you feel free to use your microphones or um, text or use the chat. Um, Mayor McGrabby here. Uh, if I could speak, I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, I want to thank Nathan. That was an excellent presentation. Um, one of the things that, that I've learned is that uh, uh, sometimes a little benefits a lot. The percentages are there. And I think sometimes what we hear is it's got to be all in or nothing. And I think that's one thing. The other one is uh, I'm glad to hear, and, I, and I've always I've followed it, a lot of our forefathers, if you want to call them, or past councils and, and members of uh, Lackabish County did do uh, some things to help with our BNR plant, um, you know, getting the waste after it was treated that goes into our lake, but they didn't kind of figure out feel lake comes back into our lake through Redbrook. Um, so um, I had mentioned before, and I think I, we, a study was done in 1989 uh, by Alberta Environment. And it's, uh, it's quite, uh, uh, quite, how could you say, I don't understand it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So it's kind of kind of complex about the level of our lake, the, the flow. Uh, so I passed that on to I got it from a resident, and it was um, we we had it uh, copied with all the colors and everything and the four options to do with the lake. And uh, so I've given it over to our environment, and then uh, we'll probably have some people do uh, our uh, people that understand what it actually says. Uh, and, and we, they had four uh, proposals, and in them proposals, uh, they you know give you different options. And uh, I think once we translate that, it's like in a foreign language for a poor guy like me uh, that just knows sports. So um, I, I really enjoyed this presentation, and uh, we may ask you to do another one for our council. <laughs> just so, you know. Well, I, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I, I think uh, there there is a few studies that that were done. I know Anne Marie Anderson, uh, back when she was with the department, had had done some studies on on Field Lake, um, and I, I mean I won't comment. But what I got out of them is, is essentially uh, when the applicant got moved to Field Lake. They started paying attention to what was going on in Field Lake. Um, they noticed the eutrophication and that uh, water was flowing back into Lackland Fish through Red Deer Brook. Um, that's so, kind of the Coles notes, I believe. So when um, when we had the floods here uh, uh, in Lackland Fish here this year, you're right. Our culverts weren't big enough. But one of the main things was we've got all this pavement now. Highway 55, we got these four major highways, and we are a catch basin. And you're right, there's nothing stopping the water. And uh, storm water wasn't uh, a very known word, if you want to call it, until the last uh, 10 or 12 years. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Uh, that's, uh, we're going to have to, uh, we have some work to do for sure. Well, we, we all do. And, and like I said, there's a, um, I'm glad you made the point earlier is that just not to let perfection get in the way of progress, right? Um, even an imperfect step forward is still a step in the right direction. So, I mean, um, it, it's, um, that, I'll leave it at that, is that uh, 
we encourage any efforts towards improvement. Like I said, you say it much nicer, more professional than I do, but thank you. <laughs> Brian, did you have a question for us here? I can see your mic is on. Yeah, if I may, um, I put it in the chat, but uh, uh, I'm going to switch my video off again, just in case, uh, in case my connection becomes unstable again. But in the chat, I was asking about estuaries. Uh, how significant are the estuaries of creeks and rivers and streams that flow into the lake, uh, where those estuaries are big wetlands? Uh, and on reflection, I, I'm, it, I realize that this happens with quite a lot of the, the tributary streams. Owl River, the mouth of the Owl River has a sort of a, a frog's foot shape similar to uh, the mouth of the Mississippi down at, at uh, the Gulf. If you've ever seen that map, you know, the river has carried so much uh, sediment and deposited it once it reaches the lake that it forms that big... Uh, frog's foot shape kind of estuary. Um, Red Deer's Brook right here next to town flows into a huge wetland complex that stretches along Nasham Drive, a huge wide section which of course now is is a barrier because of Nasham Drive itself and also the railroad and also the highway over the years. There's been several of those kinds of barriers that have uh, cut through and, and dissected that wetland complex into a bunch of smaller pieces, but uh, Red Deer's Brook still flows into the wetland back where, um, you know, on that fateful weekend with the heavy rainfalls, uh, that's where it was all backing up. And so the, the highway intersection was underwater and, and that wetland, uh, to me, it was very obvious then that if all of those uh, roads and the railway line weren't there, that would have been a huge bay of the lake. Uh, and, and speaking of bays, Plamonon Creek comes into a kind of a pointy shaped bay of the lake. The creek that comes out by uh, Lacklebish Mission, there's also a huge wetland stretch around there. It's quite common in this lake that there's wetlands at the mouth of a creek. So if you could comment on that, I'd be curious to hear anything you can share on that. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know all of the particulars about each specific wetland, but I will kind of say that um, around the lake, in, 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 and lake levels are going to, to fluctuate. Um, and, and, and I'll come back to that point in, in a little bit. Um, but essentially, slowing the water down Right, as it flows through the wetland, is going to increase the, and it, it's the amount of time that water spends in a wetland, the more opportunities there are for nutrient removals, for settling sediments out, and for, for vegetation to, to take up those nutrients. So, um, in, in, in all of those cases, right, under normal circumstances, right, not necessarily flooding when everything's going to kind of flow right over, um, and, and I'll come back to that point, as I said. Um, in general, these wetlands just provide the opportunity, right? I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, pretend that I know all of the specifics uh, in that, but I mean, I, I, I think general bar, ballpark is that, um, you know, phosphorus retention for a lot of these wetlands tends to be around 5 to 20% of the water that flows, nutrient content of the water that flows through them. Um, uh, but again, that's just a very, very uh, general sort of ballpark and can probably be off, um, uh, you know, by a, a, a large proportion on either side of that, depending on the characteristics. But what, I would say 99 times out of 100, you're probably going to be leaving nutrients in the wetland <laughs> rather than having the wetland become a source. Now, when we have very, very high water levels, there, there is a, there's a little bit of a, uh, uh, and, and people don't often think about this, is that um, 
there is kind of a, a hidden benefit to that <laughs> in a way is that you get more outflow from the lake, right? And so that it, it often provides an opportunity for the lake to flush and to send nutrients out down the Labish River um, that at a greater, higher rate than would otherwise sort of occur. Um, so, I mean, that, that is, um, you know, probably not something that's going to, uh, you know, a lot of people don't tend to think about that, but that is another, um, another way to think about if, if you keep kind of water in the basin and, and, you know, you bring your water tables up with infiltration and preserve water on the landscape. Um, if your water table rises, a lot of the times that export increases as well, which will export I nutrients. Wanna, yeah, I just want to comment on uh, what Brian had said, if I can, and then I've got to sign off. Um, one of the things uh, in terms of the field lake, when the rains came, there was uh, beavers that had dammed, and then you said, you're right, the railroad, plus they hadn't replaced the culvert on Highway 55. They need to put in larger culverts, which means we'll have to put in larger culverts into uh, Nasham Drive, the bridge. Uh, so we're looking at, at some of that, uh, um, how could you say, mediation or mitigation to, 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 because as they increase the amount of water that's coming, it is going to flood us. So, but we do have that very large uh, wet area that can take a lot of water. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just, I don't think people know that all that stuff is going to be upsized, but I don't know. What's your opinion on that would increase, increase the, the inflow into the lake? What do you think, Mason, uh, good or bad? Well, I mean, I think when you're dealing at, at the watershed scale, um, uh, sort of a lot in, uh, you know, something like uh, a localized beaver dam or um, it, it, I'm trying to be very careful here is that um, it, it's rare that sort of uh, just one feature is going to make a dramatic change in the volume of the lake, right? Volumes are huge. Um, and um, so, I mean, a, a lot of those localized flooding events are, are, are going to be important locally, but maybe not necessarily at the scale. Um, of, of the watershed um, and, and where I'm going with this is um, what as a strategy to avoid sort of localized flooding what you want to do is within the watershed itself kind of slow water down as often early and often as you can get it to infiltrate into the ground so it doesn't flow off over land, and then it doesn't concentrate in these areas where it becomes problematic. Does that okay. kind of help? Yeah, yes, and I, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna um, throw something else in there too, and that is um, what you have been talking about, Nathan, too, about the fact that we wanna slow the water down as much as possible. So when we're thinking about culverts, um, uh, from what I've, I've uh, studied, kind of the more the better. If we, we, we just have one single big culvert that we're expecting all the water to go through, then we're going to be taking all that water that would otherwise be spread over much of the land and we're just channelizing it into a single location so the wetlands can't do uh, nearly as, as efficient as a job is if we put in 10 smaller culverts, I, which of course would be a lot more expensive to put in, yes, but they would do, then allow the water to become less channelized and we don't just have all the nutrients and all the, all the, the bad stuff running down one channel with some wet areas on the side of it, but we have all the water infiltrating through the whole wetland. I'll, I'll pass that on to uh, Alberta Transportation because <laughs> they'll tell us uh, real quickly uh, the cost. Uh, and Nathan, another thing just uh, for background, we, uh, we've been here, uh, uh, the, the Lebanese have been here and our First Nations have been thousands of years. We've been here about 130 years and our family commercial fished in lakes. Uh, we knew the lake 
quite well. We we have gotten this much moisture or pretty close to it before. The, the thing was that uh, no storm water and uh, and um, you know so we know the lake and it is a dangerous and a big lake and back to your comment uh, like when you wanted us to dredge the lake or, or, <laughs> i think environment parks are not really or even go for it. but i don't think there's enough money in the province at this time to even start so just a, just a point yeah it's, it's um yeah i mean i i, I think when we start to kind of look at the scale of some of the natural forces, it, it's pretty humbling. Yes. We do have one other question here in the, um, in the, the chat and um, Phil has asked, when a culvert shoots into a lake, what can we do as a neighbor watching that? Okay. Um, well, I mean, if, if, if you think that um there's an issue or if it's if it's something that's not necessarily um not right about it or that it's kind of causing some ecological damage um i would phone the environmental hotline the uh the province provides and i know that um they will kind of send a compliance act it doesn't mean necessarily mean that um any sort of um, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the compliance action will occur, but the, I mean, they do follow up on all of those complaints. Um, and then it can kind of at least uh, be a point of engagement uh, where we would deal with um, whatever, whoever stakeholders are in, involved and, and at least raise awareness of the issue uh, if, if there's uh, not necessarily something that the uh, the province can do, I would definitely uh, encourage you to to um, as you say, like the way our, our system is, um, people in communities or uh, in municipalities and watershed stewardship groups, um, people are empowered to um, uh, you know not necessarily compel change. Um, but uh, encourage change and, and, and good stewardship. Um, but if, if you think something is definitely damaging <laughs> the environment and, and causing, um, I would start with the environmental hotline. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the number um, uh, memorized off the top of my head. Uh, I, I don't have the number, but I've been contacted numerous times, and our county has, but um, I've got to sign off. Thank you very much again, and we may call on you again, Nathan, and thanks, Michael, for uh, setting this up. Oh, well, you're very welcome. I'm just uh, looking up the Elder and Environment hotline here, so we've got, uh, we can answer your question fully. Um, so the number, and maybe I'll, I'll put it into the chat here as well is uh, 1 800 6514. So again, that's 1 800 6514. Like we've got their personal numbers, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to open up the chat. I've got too many windows open here. <laughs> I can't. There, there is a chat. All right. There Thanks go. for that. I'll type number. that out for you. Thanks for giving me the number. That's good. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. All right. Last chance for any questions or comments. All right, Nathan, well, it, look like, it looks like we, it's about time to wrap it up. I really, really appreciate you coming and uh, speaking for us. I know I've learned some, um, some significant stuff and I'm sure everyone else has as well. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just thank you very much for taking the time to put this together for us and uh, definitely keep in touch. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for your, your time and having me and, and your time and attention. Um, I appreciate you allowing me to speak and, and share this with you. And I, I hope there actually genuinely was some value in that for, <laughs> for the audience. So, um, yeah, most that. definitely. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great evening. And don't forget, next, um, our next talk in the series is going to be, uh, make sure I don't say the wrong thing <laughs> again like I did last time, August 20th with Janine Higgins. And then the one after that is the one on September 3rd about wetlands with myself. All right. And this is uh, us. Oh, I think, Mike, I think you just said August 20th and September 3rd. Did I say wrong again? Yep. <laughs> I did again. I, oh, man. Dust. Oh, gosh. That was Keep on scrolling the, to the wrong page on my diagram or my um, okay. thing. So, yes, September 17th with Jane Daphne and, yeah, October 1st with myself. Thank you, Brian, for clarifying that. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you very great. much, Nathan. Have a great evening, everyone. You too. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for coming on.